most notably under the neocon, uh, neoconservative administration of George Bush um, in the so-called War on Terror. I want to talk about some of the ways in which um, that project hasn't gone according to plan and has deepened some of the problems now facing, uh, facing the, United, uh, the United States. Um, firstly and most obviously, it cost a hell of a lot of money. And it's not clear that uh, the project of spending money on armaments is actually managing to shift the economic balance back in favour of the United States. If you're a declining economic power with a very, very powerful military apparatus, what you want in the end of the day is for that military strength to be able to re-tilt, to reorder uh, the economic board in your favour. It's not clear that that's doing it. It is clear, however, that it's costing an enormous amount of money. These are the, the spend on Iraq and uh, on the Afghan and on the Afghan uh, on the Afghan wars, um, it's also clear that this combination of a neoliberal and globalised world, um, uh, combined with a war where the sole remaining military superpower has a propensity for military action, is creating a world in which economic instability and warfare are constant hallmarks, constant dangers, constant presences in the world. Uh, but it's also clear that it's producing a reaction um, on the part of millions of ordinary people in the world. This is a map which shows um, food prices against places where there have been um, a riot, revolution or social un unrest um, in, the, uh, in the recent period, uh, including the period of the, of the Egyptian revolution. And if you see this second peak, you have... Uh, 300 plus um, uh, moments of unrest, riot, and rebellion in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt, at the peak of the, where the food crisis peak at this uh, at this point. Now, that's not to say, of course, that the only drivers of revolution, the only drivers of social unrest, uh, can be simply reduced to food prices. But it is one point. It is one element where you can very, very clearly see the intersection between. Um, political instability in, in the Middle East as a result of the war on terror, um, social instability produced by neoliberal economic policies, because we, sh we should never forget that the, um, the Arab dictators, Ben Ali, um, uh, ben Ali and Mubarak, uh, were neoliberal dictators. They were people who embraced the free market ideology, who sold off very large parts of what of the state-owned uh, of the state-owned assets in in those countries, where wealth flowed up uh, uh, towards the, the 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 governmental elite, often towards the governing families themselves, the Mubarak family, the Ben Ali family, were were, were personally enriched to an enormous degree um, by this uh, by this whole process. So we have a period in which there is widespread neoliberal uh, economic policies on a global scale where American power is uh, declining economically, where its military propensity is producing a sustained um, series of military conflicts and where there is an enormous reaction, not just in the Arab world, but if we look at the upheaval in Latin America in, in the last uh, decade or so, if we look at the reactions in Greece or in Spain or in Brazil recently to the economic crisis, we can see um, a huge kind of uh, to use CIA term terminology, a huge blowback um, from uh, from ordinary people on a kind of global on a kind of global scale. Of course, the 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 war on terror has been um, unsuccessful in in direct application. I would argue as well, or to a degree, unsuccessful. Um, the project in Iraq was to create a stable pro-Western, pro-business base for operations for the United States uh, in, uh, in Iraq. Militarily, that was a failure. At the end of this process, um, although, as I've said, there were various economic gains made for America in, uh, in Iraq, the Iraqi government forced the United States to quit militarily. There was supposed to be, or the Americans wanted there to be, a status of forces agreement which would have left 50,000 American troops permanently state stationed in, in, in Iraq. That proved to be absolutely unacceptable politically in, in Iraq, and the Americans were forced to quit 
uh, to, to quit Iraq. The current Iraqi government is uh, composed of political forces which are, half of which, are favourable to Iran. And what the Iraq war has actually done, um, precisely because it was a failure militarily, it was a failure for the United States, is to create Iran as an even more powerful regional player than it was before the American, uh, the American invasion. And we can see some of the effect of that um, now being fought out um, in Syria. The British Foreign Secretary made a speech um, a couple of years ago where he said there is a new Cold War in the Middle East. On one side of this Cold War are Iran, Syria, Hezbollah and Hamas. On the other side of the Cold War are Britain and America, Saudi Arabia and the State of Israel. And so they now see the post-Iraq Middle East as a conflict for inf influence between Iran and its allies, among which of course is Syria, and uh, their allies in, in the region, most importantly Saudi Arabia and, uh, and the State of Israel, the other Gulf states included, of course. And that conflict you can see being played out very directly now in, in Syria, where there is an effectively a proxy war between the Assad regime and its backers, including uh, the Russian state, and the rebel forces which are being armed uh, and increasingly controlled by Turkey and, uh, and, the Gulf, and the Gulf states. You can see the failure in Afghanistan can be judged very simply. The, Af the Afghanistan war was launched on the basis that the Taliban were absolutely unacceptable and had to be removed. More than a decade later, it is now a negotiation between the Americans and the British about how much of a post-withdrawal uh, role the Taliban will have in the Afghan government. So a war started um, and conducted with the loss of tens of thousands, at the minimum, tens of thousands of Afghan lives is being concluded by the very forces that it was supposed to be removing, returning, uh, returning uh, to power. Of course, in the same, uh, in the same uh, time frame, um, you have the rise of China, the so-called Pacific pivot, uh, the redeployment of American forces uh, towards the Pacific uh, to deal with the rise of China. And this, by the way, is also, I've included Africa here because Africa is now becoming a theatre uh, of, this, of this conflict. The Americans are militarily dominant in, um, in North Africa, but if you look at the, uh, the, the largest single investor in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, that's the Chinese. And you can see that fault like being worked out in the conflict in, in uh, Mali at the, at the moment. So um, that's um, a, brief kind of, a, a brief kind of description of the uh, power which the uh, American state still possesses, its uh, paradox of being um, a declining economic power and an overwhelmingly superior military power, some of the consequences of that, and I believe some of the consequences of the failure to deploy, deploy that power successfully in its own interests uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's much more that I could say, um, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.